It was mid-April 2077 when the first human case was diagnosed. It was in a 20-something year old prostitute working at one of the new women-run brothels in Karbala. Blood had been drawn and tested for her monthly medical exam and the results were positive for that same virus that had been wiping out all of the world's domesticated dogs. There was only an estimated 200 or so of the dogs left, and all of them lived in Indian slums. They were not the property of Hindi sadhus, but they did sit at their holy feet, begging parallel to them on dusty roadsides. No one knew for sure why the virus hadn't killed them, though they all had it, just like every other canine on the planet. But their coats were still full, their noses still wet, their bark still matched their bite, and their tails still wagged. Some people suspected them to have some sort of mutated super immune systems from drinking sewer water, an urban legend that was rapidly perpetuated. Some said that they were the reincarnation of Hindu gods. Some joked that the dogs that died in the other countries should have converted to Hinduism. If it hadn't saved them, at least they'd get another chance in the next life. It would seem that sometimes the infection itself is the cure. It was quite a gruesome sight, though, to see all those former canine companions lying in the streets of well-developed first world cities. There were more dogs than parked cars. Some dead with holes covering their rib protruded bodies patched with tufts of discolored fur, formerly golden retrievers looking like piles of molded Swiss cheese melting on a sun-soaked pavement. Some whimpering, some still, still collared, abandoned by their owners, left to die, waiting like bags of trash, like a, like a plate of leftovers, waiting for volunteers in hazmat suits to scoop them into doggy bags and toss them into the backs of sanitation trucks. It was first diagnosed to the seeing eye dogs, the, then the bomb sniffers, the purebreds, the, the Hollywood actor dogs, and the firehouse Dalmatians. Within four months, just about every mutt on the planet was gone. And all the billions of dogs that died from this holy plague experienced the same symptomatic decline. They, they lost their fur. It fell in clumps. They, they lost their sense of smell and with it their will to be territorial. They lost their ability to bark. Only soft groans and painful whimpers escaped them. And of course, they were covered in the trademark holes of the virus forming all along their torsos, somehow plugged by scabbing as to not allow blood to spill out of them. The holes were the crowning symptom of the virus. That's what prompted newscasters to refer to it as the holy plague. Virologists from every corner of the globe were hell-bent on making a name for themselves by identifying it. Virologists from all over the planet were spending every dime funded their way towards finding out what it was. They were all eager to win the Nobel Prize for saving man's best friend. Some say they were too hasty about coming to a conclusion, that they were just in it for the laboratory funding, for the notoriety. However, it is important to remember that at that time, most people just accepted whatever the nightly news told them. So when a young virologist from Cambridge, who happened to be the great-great-great-grandson of one Stephen Hawking, published a paper in a popular science journal and held a globally televised press conference claiming that he had identified the virus, or at least the antibodies that fought it, and that we can now start looking for a cure, for, for a vaccination, that we can now begin testing for it in human beings. The whole world breathed a sigh of relief. The press conference was held on April 1st, 2077. It played on every channel. It interrupted every single program on television. It popped up on every device, on every single screen, in every crevice of the modern world. It was even airing on mute as that young woman from the brothel was, entering one, was entertaining one of her guests. She was diagnosed two weeks after that press conference. She'd shown none of the physical symptoms associated with the virus prior to her blood test, but shortly after her diagnosis, while being observed, studied, and treated in quarantine by a team of virologists, while, while being pump filled with cocktails of toxic drugs, while being caged like a, like a zoo animal in the sterility of a windowless hospital room with no physical contact, no family, no friends, no love, no good news, and the weight of impending doom weigh, weighing down on her, those symptoms, they, they showed up. She began to lose her hair. It fell out in clumps. Two weeks later, her sense of smell faded away. Her voice retracted deep into her throat. She could hardly whisper by the time the first hole appeared. And the holes, oh, the holes were everywhere. She looked like a piece of coral. Her skin like the surface of the moon, like a dried out sponge laying motionless on overstarched bed sheets. She died in quarantine a month after her diagnosis. After that, the virus spread. See, first it was just reported throughout Arab countries, amongst the Muslim world, so some blamed the entire epidemic on the Islamic women's rights movement of the 2050s, <laughs> claiming it had promoted too much sexual liberation. 
that the virus was the embodiment of God's disapproval, as much a holy plague as it was a, a holy plague. However, when human cases started being diagnosed all around the world, people stopped considering it a virus of lifestyle. The old woman in Florence, the seven-year-old boy in Wyoming, the middle-aged rabbi from Liverpool, I mean, these were hardly practitioners of sexual liberation. 